Okay, uh, please join us after he played his suit once. <laughs> That was really nice. <laughs> Welcome to uh, First, First United Presbyterian Church, the heart of Christ and the heart of Loveland. We're a worshiping body of the Presbyterian Church USA and joyfully welcome all of you to our worship gathering today, whether you're here on site or joining us online. If you're with us on site, please remember to wear your name tag. If you're a visitor or new attendee, we'd be happy to make a name tag for you so we can get to know you better. If you're with us online, we encourage you to say good morning to us in the chat so we know you're here. Uh, for announcements, Pastor Amy is on study leave this week, so we're grateful to have the Reverend Dr. Lyle Vanderbrook preaching in her absence. Thank you. We'll also be celebrating communion today, so if you're worshiping with us online, please have your elements prepared. Uh, also, uh, we're doing kickball, so uh, it's a fun, fun way to spend a Wednesday night, 7, 7.30, or show up around 7, uh, down at the ballpark south of town, uh, or just come and clap if you'd like to do that. Uh, that's, we'd, we'd love to have some folks come, 
So it's a lot of fun. Come join us. Any other announcements? Good morning. I'm Debbie Moorhead, personnel elder, and I'm up here today with exciting, fun news. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Brandon Downing. He is back there sitting by Dave. He is here, and he is our new organist, pianist, a new staff member for our church. Today he's observing everything that's going on, and uh, he will be tinkering with the organ and doing all sorts of things. Um, he's very anxious to um, uh, begin playing uh, the organ and the piano for us. He's an amazing uh, pianist with all sorts of um, uh, honors. He is currently the accompanist at Poudre High School in Fort Collins for all their choir and drama and all their performances. And he also has a wonderful job at, um, let me get it right, um, he's a piano instructor at Foundation Music School, uh, which is a wonderful, uh, in the evening I believe, and they help students um, who can't necessarily afford um, other th in musical enrichment opportunities. It sounds like a wonderful program, and he's, worked, he's working there. So there will be more about him in the Timely News, and uh, we welcome him. And next week, we will also have Mr. Uh, Brian Kettlewell is becoming our music director, and he is the choir director at Thompson Valley High School. So we have so much energy and enthusiasm and um, the opportunity um, to really enliven all the things that are going on. So... Thanks to Angela for all of the, everything she is doing and done to help the transition. We could not have done the last three months without you, so thank you so much. And I'd also ask that anybody who's in choir, if they could meet over by the piano right after service for a brief gathering, um, I'd like to try and set up a meeting. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Vicki Robinson, one of the deacons here. And um, I've made up a new sign-up sheet for fellowship refreshments. I think the first three months trying this new way have been off to a great start. So thanks to everyone. And there's a new opportunity, a new sign-up sheet. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Paula Waldorf, Mission and Social Justice Committee Elder, and um, I, if it's okay, I'm gonna be reading because I have several important announcements and I don't wanna forget anything. So um, and there's two major announcements. The first is we are now in the beginning of the second of four of this year's special offerings of the Presbyterian Church USA. These special offerings represent the single largest collective effort of Presbyterians to support ministries which create a positive impact and share God's grace and love, locally and worldwide. We just completed, as you all know, the first of the special offerings, One Great Hour of Sharing, uh, which went through Lent and, and which many of you gratefully um, contributed to, and thank you so very, very much. On April 1st, which was actually last week, through May 19th, we now have the second offering, which is the Pentecost offering, which unites us in a church-wide effort to support young people and inspire them to share their faith, ideas, and unique gifts to the church and the world. A gift to the Pentecost offering helps the church encourage, develop, and support its young people and also addresses the needs of at-risk children. To let you know, which I think is important, 40% of the Pentecost offering is retained by individual congregations wanting to make an impact in the lives of young people within our own community. The remaining 60% is used to support children at risk, youth, and young adults through ministries of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. I have placed several types of Pentecost offering pamphlets in the fellowship area back there, uh, which are yours to please take. This time, thank heavens, they included in our packets um, whoops, uh, envelopes to put your Pentecost offering in. So those are on the back table, all six of the back tables and also on the one under the bulletin board there. Um, I will also place some information in the timely news 
um, throughout the next couple weeks. So please consider this as a critical way to support our youth and our, continue our faithful and generous support of giving to these special offerings. Um, just as a little side note, and I'll try to put this in the, in the timely news. When we did the one great hour sharing the baskets, you know, you all contributed to the, the innards, the, the, the supplies inside the baskets. We took money from the, Pen, from the Pentecost part of, the, of donations from last year to contribute to those baskets, which went to at-risk kids. So that's how we're giving back in the different missions we're doing. The second announcement is next Sunday, April 14th, following our regular church service during the fellowship time back there, 1030 to 11. We are inviting all of you uh, to join us for a brief five to 10 minute information sharing by uh, a representative from Together Colorado who po will provide us some key points regarding an upcoming community-wide public forum to be held Saturday at 10 o'clock, May 4th at St. John's Catholic Church. Um, additionally, during this fellowship time for those attending, we will prepare postcards, invitations for the upcoming public forum that are going to be sent to key community leaders and organizations to get them to participate in this crucial public forum, which is actually going to deal with some priorities that Loveland, um, Together Colorado, has addressed in Loveland, one of which has been the unhoused and the homeless. So please stay tuned for information in the timely news and plan to remain for 30 minutes after next Sunday. April 14th. Thank you. One more, and I'll make it really quick. I'm Ginger uh, Treadwell from Building and Grounds, a committee member. And uh, I know some of you have already seen in the newsletter that we have changed the locks on uh, the church doors. And we now have keypad access at our ramp entrance and then at our basement. Uh, entrance down by the kitchen. So uh, it does allow for better security of our building. It also uh, kind of uh, gives more access in some ways to our outside groups that we have that uh, participate in activities here. We've got Girl Scouts and Fiber Arts and um, a guitar choir and several uh, organizations that meet in our building. And this allows them to have access into our building um, without having a key. So if there is anyone here that are, is a key holder, uh, it will no longer work. And if you have a need to have a code to get in, mostly like this morning, it won't make any difference. Uh, we have access to all the doors. They're open uh, just as they are every Sunday morning. But if there is a reason uh, for you, please see me, and I'd be happy to give you a code. Thanks so much. No, no other announcements. Uh, long list of credentials on the music. I really want to see how well your kickball game shows up, too. Uh, <laughs> also, if you could bring any of those high schoolers over to help us, it would be super awesome. All right. <laughs> we come together as kindred spirits, gathering our joy and suffering, our faith and doubt into the presence of Christ, who speaks to us and gives us peace. Hallelujah. Let us worship God.
In the season of Easter, we focus on the joy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In place of our typical prayer of confession, we will share in a prayer of adoration that expresses this joy. I will introduce each section of the prayer, leave time for silent, silent contemplation, and then, choose, and then close the section by saying, Alleluia, Alleluia. We will then be invited to sing, Bless the Lord, before moving on to the next section. Let us begin our prayer with this song. God, we praise you for the new life we see in the creation around us. Alleluia, alleluia. We praise you for the abundant life that we experience now and are promised always in your resurrection. Alleluia, alleluia. Spirit, we praise you for the ways you draw us closer to God, our neighbors, and our truest selves. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. Their sign of our peace is the body of Christ a beloved family of faith. If you're here on site, please greet the people near you in the pews and wave to the camera up front to greet those worshiping with us online. If you're with us online, please share words of peace in the comments on YouTube or send a text to someone else from our church family. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you.
Make music videos on Music Sunday. Begin! Record making backdrop with slime. Okay, give one to Judd to tack up. What can you do? Ooh. Ooh, it looks even... Lighting finish. Oh, no, that looks great. No! Backdrop oh, finish. See what... Don't you go my Is that better? <gasps> yes. So this morning, Pastor Amy asked me if I would help tell the story of Easter today. It's like, what? We already talked about Easter, didn't we? Judd, did we talk about Easter already? Did we talk about Easter? And it was a mystery. Did we ever solve the mystery yet? No. We didn't solve the mystery. What is the mystery? Do you remember? How about you? Do you remember what it is? That he died and he was buried and he came back. Who was that? Yes. He came back and he came and he was with the rest of the people and he was with who else? Who else was he with? The 12 disciples. Some of the disciples were missing, though. One of them was. He had done some bad things. And he had done some bad things. And he told people that Jesus, where he was, and then he had to die, didn't he? You remember? Mm-hmm. And... Oh, you don't remember? That's okay. I wasn't there either. But I believe the story because a lot of people have been telling Jesus' story for a very long time. And one of the disciples was his friend, and his name was Thomas. And he didn't get to see Jesus either. And he said, no, I don't believe you. Jesus didn't come back. And so what did Jesus do, do you think? Do you know? He went and he saw Thomas. And so Thomas, sometimes we have a name for somebody who doesn't believe everything they hear. 
doubting Thomas. Do you believe everything you hear, Judd? I didn't think so. Neither do I. Neither do I. And when Pastor Amy said that we were going to talk about Easter today, I got kind of confused because it's like, well, that was last week. We already celebrated. But look, we still have all of our raiments up and our Easter decorations and flowers. But Jesus came back because he wanted Thomas to know that he was still there. So he came back just to Thomas. And what did he let, what did he let Thomas see? Do you know? His hands. Remember? What happened to, to Jesus' hands? Do you remember? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what else? Mm-hmm. He was on the cross, but he didn't stay on the cross, did he? So but what did he do? What else did he show him? Something else. Somebody had stabbed him in the side with a sword, and he sh showed Thomas that, too. Because everybody was so worried after Jesus died, they didn't know what to do, did they? And so what did Jesus do? He came back so we could, we could go in peace. We need to go in peace. And we need to, if we believe in Jesus and God, then we go in peace and we help other people learn to live in peace too, don't we? Okay. And guess what else? I asked Judd if he believed that I knew magic. And he doesn't believe me because he's not a, he's a, he's a doubting Judd, not a doubting Thomas. But I learned a magic trick and I do not understand how I can do it. Okay, so I'm gonna let you do the magic trick I did last night. Mm-hmm. And it really happens. And you can make something fly. Do you want to come up here and show everybody? Because it's going to fly. And if, they, if you're here, they can see it go. OK? Can you do that? I mean, I could take it all apart, but it will take so long if I do. But it is a real dollar bill. It's the only cash I have. It's like, I don't have cash anymore. And what are those things? Okay. Do you think, Judd, do you think you can make magic? Do you think you can do something that's impossible? Okay. So, did Thomas think it was impossible that Jesus come back? Yeah. Okay, so I want you to hold with, you got to stand up a little bit. Remember, if you stand up here, then if you turn around a little bit, people might be able to see it fly. I don't know. Okay. I didn't think I could do magic. I didn't think it was real either. I thought it was silly, and I did not want to do this. I thought... Well, that's like really dumb for Easter. What the heck? I know why. Why? I know why it's going to work. It's paper. Paper just floats down. It does. Okay, one hand here. One hand here. Uh -huh. And you have to hold really tight and with the other hand on that one. And hold it up high. N not yet. Pull really hard. Fast. Oh, nope. Oh, nope. Got to do it again. You have to do it really hard. Should I do it first?
or something where you have to do it really hard. Okay. And let go. Okay. Go up in there. Really hard. Good morning, everyone. Rachel, my wife Rachel, and I are glad to be here this morning. We have actually worshipped with you before, uh, and we've known Amy for a long time, well, three or four years. So it's, uh, it's really good to be able to lead worship services here this morning. Uh, Rachel and I are fairly recent immigrants from the state of Iowa, from Dubuque, Iowa, eastern Iowa, where we both worked at the University of Dubuque Theological Seminary, one of your uh, seven Presbyterian seminaries. So, um, but it's good to be able to retire in beautiful Colorado and be with our children and grandchildren, of course, the main reason for moving. As, a, as an Iowa person, I might just put in a plug for uh, the NCAA women's uh, basketball game this afternoon, 3 o'clock. And uh, Caitlin Clark will be at her best. Of course, she'll make 40 or 50 points, you know, something like that. But it's really good viewing, isn't it? We have so enjoyed that. Well, I'm going to read this morning uh, the passage from John 20 that was referred to in our children's sermon. It's the first group appearance, resurrection of Jesus, as after his uh, meeting with Mary Magdalene at the tomb. And he shows himself as a resurrected Lord to his disciples. And as was alluded to in the children's sermon, Thomas isn't present, and that creates a bit of a problem, but listen to the word of God. John 20, verses 19 through 31. <clears throat> when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and uh, my hand in his side... I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. 
reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen? And I think this is a line, especially for us, for later Christians. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that the scripture that we read might become real to us. Help us to understand who this risen body is and what the nature of our belief in him is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The risen Christ bears the marks of the crucifixion. Wounds on his, in his side and on his hands. And these marks are important to the disciples as proof that he is the same person. It's one way of identifying him, isn't it? So they meet Jesus. Jesus shows him the marks of his time on the cross. The problem is, of course, is that Thomas is not present. And Thomas declares, I think like many of us would, that this just can't be. Unless I see, unless I touch, I can't believe this. Well, a week later, Jesus appears again to the group, and this time Thomas is present. And Jesus invites him to touch these wounds. And Thomas does believe. He declares Jesus, he says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says something that I think is so powerful and important for us so far removed from the event. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's for us, isn't it? We all wish we could have seen and met the resurrected Christ. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus appears to the disciples, and he has these wounds of the cross, but he is not just the same body as before. That becomes immediately apparent in this story, doesn't it? He appears in rooms where the doors are shut. He is suddenly in their midst. Jesus has a strange new resurrection body, what Paul calls a spiritual body. It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? How can it be both spirit and body? Um, But I think what we're talking about here is the same kind of body that we will have when we are raised from the dead, a spiritual body. It's what we look forward to in the resurrection. The body of the risen Christ who appears to Mary and all the disciples is a strange combination, isn't it, of the old and the new. There is both continuity and discontinuity compared with his previous body. I'm reminded of the phrase Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to describe the risen Christ. There, Paul, talking about the foolishness of the cross, affirms that we proclaim the risen Christ as the Christ crucified. Isn't that interesting? The risen Christ is still the Christ who has been hung on a cross. 
He has been crucified. He is now the crucified one. The Christ who has been raised, who sits at the right hand of the Father, bears the marks of the cross. The cross continues to be a key to his identity. The suffering and the atoning love shown in his crucifixion is not left behind, but guides him as he rules with the Father. Christ is risen, yes, but he is the, res but, but he is the crucified one. We've just finished celebrating Jesus' resurrection and all it promises for us. God's affirmation of all that Jesus did and said on earth, including the cross. God's affirmation of the end times and the resurrection of believers and the restoration of creation. But maybe you've noticed something a bit out of whack about the Easter celebrations, a deep tension in what we say. In spite of our celebration of the new life, death still happens. We continue in sin. We still stand in need of redemption. The earth's transformation has not occurred. The truth is that the full impact of the resurrection lies in the future. We live in hope and trust. As Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Blessed are those who can live this, in this ambiguity and look forward to what is coming. We as Christians live in an odd place, I think. Much like the oddness of the wounded body of the resurrected Christ, we experience some of the benefits of the new age. What would you say some of those benefits are? What does the resurrection mean for us now? Well, it means we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. It means that we have the gift of communion, of community gathering, the love we experience with one another. But our lives are still very much lived in the old age, unfortunately. The marks of suffering on Jesus' body, the signs of atonement, speak to us loud and clear in an age that is still far from completely redeemed. The struggle of the Christian life is that we have glimpses of the new in the midst of the old. Don't we all feel that strongly? So we have all these promises, forward-looking promises, and yet all this trouble, sin, lack of redemption, if you will, in the present. We have war and crime and poverty and disease. There are mass shootings. There are tensions of all kinds in our country. We live in a world filled with turmoil. And yet in the midst of this, we as Christians are propelled by hope, or we claim to be. It can be a difficult thing. One of the essential truths of the resurrection, of the resurrection both Jesus and ours, is that there is a continuity between this body and the new one. The marks of the crucifixion appear in Jesus' new resurrection body. Jesus has the same personality, and he retains his knowledge and his friends. Some things have changed, but it is clear that Jesus is the same person the disciples knew before. God doesn't start over in the resurrection. He transforms whether it is us or creation. This means, I think, that what we are and what we make of ourselves, what we make of the world, is the basis for God's new age. We are part of the building of God's kingdom, and that is important work. I have long quarreled with a line in the Presbyterian Confession of 67. It's a minor thing, but speaking about the church doing God's work, the confession says, if the church does not identify limited progress, with the kingdom of God on earth. And I would say to that, why not? It's not just God's work, it's our work as well, isn't it? The church does not somehow build the kingdom of God by itself, no, but surely our limited progress is a sign of our good work in building God's kingdom. It's precisely God, what God expects us to do as Christians. We help build the kingdom with an eye toward the future. Too often, I'm afraid, we as individual Christians and the church at times have thought that 
One of the benefits of the faith is that it helps us escape the world and get away. Have you sometimes felt like that? I think it's a pretty common feeling among Christians. We become escapist, right? Um, we want to get, get away from all the sin and turmoil in this world. When we die, we go away. I'll fly away, you know? It's, uh, of course. I mean, that's part of who we are. And certainly heaven is real. We have the promises that when we die, we go to be with Jesus. There is some relief and escape at that point. But I think we need to make it clear in light of the resurrection that this experience with Jesus after death is only the first step in the larger experience. Over and over again, the New Testament talks about resurrection. People will be raised. You, when Christ comes again, there will be resurrection. When Christ comes again, there will be restoration of our creation. These promises are very, very clear in the New Testament. And unfortunately, they haven't been proclaimed often enough in the church. So we live as Christians not to somehow escape this body or escape this world, but to be part of a resurrected body that will be in this world and part of a restored creation that will do God's work. It's all about God recreating this world. What would you say? I mean, when you think about it, what is the point of, res what is the, point of the empty tomb? Is it just hope generally? No, it's specifically the hope of a resurrected body. Christ, the empty tomb, Christ's resurrected body is the first fruits of our resurrection. People will be raised from the dead. I know that sounds weird. It sounds strange, but that's the essential teaching of the empty tomb as it relates to Christianity. And it's just the opposite of escapist. It's about God's power coming to earth and redeeming this world, make it, making it into a Garden of Eden again, if you will. Remember what the Apostles' Creed says. We believe in the resurrection of the body. In the incarnation of Jesus Christ, Christ taking human form, and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the raising of his body, we see God's great love for his creation. Bodies are valued. It's not just a spiritual existence that we have after this life. It is a bodily existence. True, that oxymoron, a spiritual body, it's different, but it's also the same. It's really you. There, are, there, there will be memories from your past. It will be you in your own identity. The point of the Christian life is not to escape this world, but to take part in the shaping of it into God's future kingdom. Like God, we love what God has created. And isn't that the essential impetus for all the work we do with environment and keeping God's world going and getting rid of crime and helping to help the helpless and, and do all the things that peace-loving Christians do? We're helping to build a kingdom to build a foundation here that will be fulfilled when Christ returns. The Lord is risen. Now, to that you should say, he is risen indeed. The Lord is risen. Is risen and think what that means for you and your future and the future of this world. We have all these promises. It's an incredible story of hope, isn't it? Even though we live in this time of ambiguity in the present. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The resurrection of Jesus and even the nature of the re his resurrection body show what an odd interim period we live in. But we also look forward in hope, and we know that we have lots of important work to do as Christians. We're striving to do what we can do to build God's kingdom here. Amen.
We as Christians give because we have been given to, we have been blessed so abundantly. In the spirit of the first believers, we are called to share our goods in common and contribute to the needs of the poor with glad and generous hearts. We are grateful to those who continue giving to the ministry of this church online and through the mail. If you'd like to leave an offering here on site, there are offering plates as you exit the sanctuary. We lift our whole lives to God, and so we share in communion. We share the joys and concerns of this community. Are there joys and concerns that the congregation would like to share with one another this morning? I have a coworker um, that is a mother of a young child, and she was just recently diagnosed with uh, brain cancer, a tumor in her brain, and is going through just the early stages of treatment. So please keep her in your prayers. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that you hear this prayer request and hear all of our concerns that are on our mind. Be with those who are weak, those who are sick. Be with those who are depressed or those who are seeking work. Gracious God, we stand in need of the blessings that you bring. Uh, give us your mercy and peace. Help us to live bold and loving lives as followers of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are blessed to be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning as our servers come forward. I have a, I have a liturgy that describes the Lord's Supper with three words, and I always think it's such a good way to talk about what we're doing here. It says the Lord's Supper is a feast of remembrance. Maybe that's what first comes to mind. The bread, the cup, make us remember the cross, don't they? What happened on the cross, Jesus giving himself for us, and how that atones for our sin, and gives us life. So we come in remembrance. This do in remembrance of me, Jesus says. But we also come in communion, in a sense of community. This, in a sense, I suppose, it's like the family gathering for a meal. These, according to the Bible, these people sitting next to you are your brothers and sisters, and you should love them in that way should honor them and take care of them. This is the family of God. This is the communion of God meeting. Certainly communion with God in a deep way as well, but it's communion with one another. Remembrance, communion, what would the last one be? Well, this liturgy says hope. You know, we look forward. It isn't all fulfilled. As good as the Christian life can be in the present, we experience God's love and the love of those around us. We look forward to, we look forward in hope. For what? Well, I hope you heard what I said in the sermon. We look forward to resurrection. We look forward to restoration. Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God. And we believe that the kingdom of God is coming here to earth. Imagine that what that will be. So remembrance communion, and hope. We are invited to this table, whether we know it all or know nothing, whether we are very religious or very skeptical. In other words, everybody's invited. This is not a closed communion. Whether we are spiritually rich or soulful, soulfully impoverished, this is the table of Jesus Christ. He is the host, and we come at his invitation. This is your invitation to know the resurrected Christ, to encounter the sacredness of ordinary things, 
and to be united as one body in this ministry, mystery. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our greatest joy, Creator God, to give you thanks in every time and every place. You made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, sun, moon, stars, mountains, rivers, and trees, animals, and people. You even made us in your own image to love and serve you. And you show us the, your mercy every day. Therefore, with all the people and all creation, we sing your praise. Blessing are yours, saving God, for in your mercy you gave us your only Son, Jesus Christ. Born as a child like us, he grew up to be your servant. Jesus taught the truth. He welcomed, healed, forgave, and loved people. In the end, he suffered and died to save us from our sin. And God raised him up to give us new life. <clears throat> We praise you that before he died, our Savior gave us the holy meal to eat together until he comes again. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same night, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. We remember God's gracious love for us, Christ's death and resurrection for us, and the Spirit's tender care for us. And remembering, we offer ourselves our gifts for the world. We ask God to pour out the Holy Spirit on us and on these ordinary gifts of bread and cup. Make them special and holy so that they can bring us closer to each other and closer to God. We pray for those in our church and community, those who have special needs to share. Gracious God, be with all those in our congregation who need your healing hand Help us to be caregivers to our brothers and sisters in this community. Help us to solve the problems of the world, to stop war, to speak to the problems of starvation and genocide, to work to end crime in this world. Help us to be instruments in your grace. And we pray this all through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray to our Lord God who loves us like a mother, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I understand that it is uh, customary, and you, I'm sure you all know this, to partake by intinction. Is that correct? Uh, we have 
you're going to have to show me exactly how you set up, but people can come up and take the bread, right, and take a cup, and let's, as, as a way of showing the bond of Christian community, if you can, if you dare to walk with that little cup with grape juice, uh, walk and sit down with the cup, and then we'll all partake together. I think that's customary as well. So let's, let's see if that works. I'll let these folks uh, get in their positions. of the wonderful gift that we experience. Jesus Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He died on a cross to redeem us from our sin. He rose from the dead to give us the hope of eternal life. Let's commune together. I was warned that I wouldn't eat any lunch after having that piece of bread. <laughs> and, and looking at this wonderful loaf here, someone needs to eat this and take it home. Maybe it's customary, but it looks so good. We don't want to waste anything. Let's pray together. Loving God, in deep gratitude for this moment, this meal, these people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much of us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. So God, may we live in your glory both as inhabitants of earth, as citizens, and as citizens of the commonwealth of heaven. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. by the future. Christ is risen, and that is an indication of what is promised for us, resurrection and restoration. Receive the benediction. Go in peace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>